like to welcome everybody to this month's Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook webinar, uh, which is continuing on now in 2022. Uh, we have a, a series of presentations as usual uh, with questions saved for the end. Uh, we actually do have a special guest uh, this month who has uh, a little information and request for you. And so we'll start with that. So uh, Professor Cheryl Wackenheim, the floor is yours. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. So I, I appreciate a couple of minutes today to introduce um, introduce a short survey. Let me turn this other one off. So my name is Cheryl Wackenheim, and I, I don't have a camera on this computer, but I'm as beautiful, much more beautiful than my picture as well. So what I want to talk to you, I want to solicit your participation in a survey that essentially at, tries to figure out what farmers, ranchers, and service providers, as many of you are, what they prefer happen to data that is sent to ag tech and management providers, the data generated from precision agricultural operations, once it's set up, sent up what happens to the data. And we know there's detailed privacy policies and um, data license agreements and so on, and we're not always really familiar with them. But we want to know what, what farmer ranchers and service providers think those contracts should look like. And th the question is why, and other than it being super interesting, interesting to know, it'll help us develop educational materials and, and as well as input towards a contract standardization and, and it'll help facilitate identification of, of service providers that are providing data management contracts that, that appeal to farmer ranchers and, and service providers as well. So there's already a, a movement in the, a lot of ag organizations are involved in called the Ag Data Transparent and their objective is to provide certification for um, handle firms that handle the data like we'd like. So if you could go to the next slide, there's a, well, actually I will stick here. There's the, the survey code. If you could just go there, it'd take about 10 minutes, but it's, it's a fun survey. I think you'd enjoy it a lot. So if you go to the next page real quick. All right, so one thing that this survey makes it a little bit unique is it has what they call a choice experiment in it. And essentially you answer regular questions as you would in any survey. And then the second half is, is designed to ascertain what, what people value in a contract. And we're essentially looking at four attributes. And one attributes is whether or not the farmer's getting paid to provide that data, however the service provider is using. The second is, is what happens to the data once the data goes up to the service provider. For example, can the company that has the data that's managing the data and providing you that service share that data with others? And the third is whether you retain ownership of that data. In other words, if, if a farmer changes service providers or stops using a service provider, does that data go with them or is it retained by the service provider? And then of course, ease of use is essentially how the data is moved from the machinery or equipment um, to the service provider. So we essentially ask you to look at, at two contracts and they differ by those four attributes. And doing that a series of time will provide us a lot of data, uh, a lot of valuable data about uh, what people value. So that's a lot of words, but essentially I'd, I'd love it if you took a survey. And I think it'd be, a, it'd be a lot of considerable value to the industry. And I'm working on this project with Eric Hansen. So my email was in the initial part, but you can also get it from the fellows if you have any questions. If you don't have any, if you have any questions right now, please ask. Otherwise, feel free to email me. That's all I got. Great, thanks, Cheryl. And if it's okay with you, I'll send the URL to all the attendees today. That'd be great. So I really appreciate it, and I, I hope you all enjoy your day. Thank you. Uh, moving now on to the the regular part of the program, uh, Dr. Brian Parman talking about fertilizer prices. Thank you, Dave. So. This has been being uh, uh, covered quite a bit, a lot of information in the, in the newspapers and trade journals and everything else that have come out. Uh, I spent, I did a, a several presentations on this uh, exact topic over the last couple of weeks and spent several minutes doing a podcast yesterday on uh, fertilizer prices. So my first slide shows the uh, DTN tract price of nitrogen based fertilizers, uh, which is in uh dollars per pound of n okay and so obviously something like anhydrous ammonia has more uh, pounds of n in it per ton than a product like 28 or 32 so those those products nominally will be cheaper than anhydrous but uh anhydrous still is 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 the the, the cheapest uh, price per pound of nitrogen and what you see from the chart um and this one was from uh, last week uh, week ending last week is that 
for, for the most part, most of these fertilizer products, the nitrogen products have, have uh, essentially doubled in uh, price, um, price per pound. And uh, for instance, anhydrous around this time last year was about 30 cents per pound. And now it's a little bit north of 90 cents. Uh, urea, the product that was predominantly used in North Dakota, was around 40 cents a pound of in uh, this time last year. And now it's, it's, it's a more than doubled. It's, a, it's around a dollar. And 28 and 32 have uh, increased about the same amount as well. So my next slide shows potash prices. And, and potash, uh, obviously an important nutrient that we apply quite a bit. And it, if you look at this chart here, the way to read it, that uh, dotted line at the bottom, that's the, the five-year average. Uh, the purple line is 2020. The green line is 2021. And you can see all through 2021, the, the price of potash uh, pretty much a, a straight shot um, trend uh, upwards. And it was around right around $375 a ton or so to start the year. Uh, approaching $400 a ton by this time last year, that, that'd be early February. And uh, now it's, it's uh, over $800 a ton. One thing to note about potash though, is uh, it's, it's leveled off some over the last month. It's kind of the first month that it's had uh, that where it wasn't, wasn't increasing uh, week over week. It seemed like every, every day or every other day you'd go check the prices and, and they would be higher and, and potash prices, uh, at least for the over the course of the last month, have uh, have leveled off. My next slide shows your uh, uh, phosphorus prices, the the two major phosphorus products that are put on um, MAP and DAP, um, and they're up over eighty percent from where they were about a year ago. Uh, you got MAP at about nine hundred and twenty dollars a ton nationally, and uh, DAP closer to eight hundred and eighty nationally. And those two products, for the most part, have have, have leveled off as well. Uh, you can see the red line up in the upper left corner. That's the that's the month of January for this year, uh, and the data that we have for this year. And so, it's it's leveled off compared to a year ago. Which in this chart reads like the the last couple, where you've got that five year average, which is the gray dotted line, um, and uh, it was the green line is twenty twenty one for both products. Pretty much a steady march upward uh, for for the entire year of of last year and uh, basically leveled off. Um, and so, you know, we, we I'm not saying that they're not going to uh, we're, we're not going to go back and look at the end of this week and see that they've moved upwards. But uh, it, so far, there, there's been a, a kind of a mute. They, they've muted the upward upward march of prices of uh, these two products as well as potash. Then my next slide shows uh, urea prices, that being the, the uh, predominant nitrogen product applied here in North Dakota, and it, and it too has leveled off. Now it's leveled off again at a very high number, $920 a ton, which is more than double of what it, what it was this time last year. Um, but, but there again, we, we haven't moved uh, up at all uh, since, the, since the start of the year which is kind of the first time since uh, September, October that that's been true, that, that, that it hasn't increased in price dramatically. But one thing that remains to be seen when fertilizer starts being applied heavily uh, here in the next month or so, uh, where, you, where, the, where the, uh, the Delta area uh, and across, you know, the South starts getting into the fields and starts applying these products uh, as planting season kicks off for them in late February, early March. And then uh, as the as the uh, as it starts getting warmer and planting season begins in in earnest for places like Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa and 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 onward, uh, typically that's when we see fertilizer prices in a normal year increase um, where they're the, the, the lowest that they'll typically be in the fall and then increasing as we move into spring planting and demand really picks up. But this is not a typical year. So I'm pretty reluctant to predict that we're going to see the same increase in fertilizer prices, considering how high they already are. Uh, there's a lot of other factors at play that could could uh, impact it. My impression has been, though, that we're not going to see much of a, a movement down until after planting season is over. So probably right now, as I see it, our best case scenario is uh is that they they do not march upwards uh anymore 
and, and we just kind of move sideways through the planning season uh, at the prices that we're at right now. Now, my next slide shows one, one final fertilizer product, 1034, and, and it's also up as well. Um, a lot of uh, nitrogen, uh, not a, a little bit of nitrogen in this, in this product, but what you see there is uh, uh, starting this year or last year around $470 a ton and now closer to $820 a, a ton. And it's, it's, it's up way over the, uh, the uh, five-year average as well. And one, one last thing I wanted to mention, uh, I, I've been looking at chemical prices uh, for um, a lot of these products as well, uh, uh, or uh, the, the herbicides and pesticides that are typically applied. And kind of, that's one thing that it's been talked about, but it hasn't been talked about as much. And a couple of things I of note, and I don't have a slide on it, was about this time last year, uh, glufosinate products like Liberty or the generics, uh, they were around $70 a gallon uh, around this time last year. Glufosinate now about $122 a gallon for, for name brand and about $116 a gallon for uh, generic. So up quite a bit. Glyphosate's way up. $19, $20 a gallon around this time last year. Uh, some areas are seeing it as high as $74 a gallon right now. So a big increase in, in, in glyphosate. And then products like 2,4-D, good old 2,4-D, uh, selling for 36 bucks a gallon right now. And that product's obviously been around for nearly 100 years now. So it's not just fertilizer prices, it's herbicides and pesticides. And I know uh, Ron Haugen, who worked hard to get our crop budgets put together uh, is going to do a presentation on those and talk about uh, overall uh, production costs and how they're uh, impacted this year. But that's something to think about. And uh, Frain might hit on it as well. Uh, this, this year is absolutely a year where soil testing is important. Um, there's no real way to know uh, how much residual fertilizer is left after the drought that we dealt with last year, uh, since we in a lot of areas didn't get the yields and didn't get the rain. So a lot of that fertilizer is still sitting in the ground or, or a good bit of it. How much is, is impossible really to know unless you go out and do soil testing and soil testing will probably pay for itself this year. That's, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is it's, it's going to be awfully tough if we spend what we're going to have to spend to make a crop this year and we don't protect ourselves with, uh, with uh, the ability to use the market to, to hedge this year. And so that's, that's kind of the, the story that we're all telling. And so I believe a question popped up, but I think we're gonna do those to the end. Oh, yes, I guess there was a comment real quick. Urea quotes locally this week are down to 750 to $780 a ton range. Well, that's good. Uh, and and this, these were national numbers. Uh, that's one thing to to be that's important. You know, when when anhydrous was uh, was really peaking, uh, there were reports of sixteen hundred dollars a ton, and then you'd look in a place like Iowa, and it'd be uh, thirteen fifty, fourteen hundred dollars a ton, especially if it was kind of near, really near a plant. So, I yes, you're right. They can be down, and that's and and that actually brings up a really good point. Um, and one of the things that a lot of our co-ops and, and other areas were afraid of is if they're out there buying, let's say, urea for $800, $850 a ton, and then all of a sudden prices come down to $750 a ton, how much do they have on hand and are they left holding the bag with high price fertilizer? It's a, it's a dangerous situation financially for some, especially the smaller cooperatives and stuff. So as high as fertilizer prices uh, were to, to end last week, they, they've been volatile and I, I'm not surprised at all if the if the local quotes are down to $750 a ton right now it's it, it's very possible considering how high they were and it doesn't take a huge percentage change to come down a hundred bucks when you're when you're starting at a thousand or 950 so that's a that's a great uh, uh, comment and on supply issues for fertilizer in the spring I guess I'll go ahead and hit that real quick uh, yes I think that there probably will be uh, if, if not for any other reason, then there may be some folks who are reluctant to price fertilizer when the price was high and cooperatives are not going to buy a bunch of high price fertilizer and have it sitting there on hand because of fears that the price could fall. 
And if that if something like that happens again, that could absolutely cause a financial, a real big financial hardship for those cooperatives. So there may be some logistical issues with and and uh, supply issues with with uh, these these entities, the agrochemical dealers having it on hand. So I, I am worried about that. That that that's absolutely true. So, uh, but thank you uh, everyone and. Uh, if there are any further questions, I'll, I'll try to answer them at the end. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Olson. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm Frank Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, here's my contact information. So again, as we finish things up, if you do have some questions that come up later, uh, feel free to, to contact me. I'll do my best to try and answer them. So the other thing I want to mention as I start, I'm actually speaking um, in Minot today. I'm, I'm broadcasting from Minot right now. Um, I'll be joining a conference here in town uh, shortly. So I'm going to be giving my talk um, and hopefully we'll have a couple minutes for Q&A. And then I'm going to have to, to, uh, to drop off the call to be able to, to get ready for my next presentation. So just so you're aware, think of some questions now as I'm going through my, my um, discussion. So on my first slide, I wanted to uh, give you an update on kind of the summary of the information we got from the WASDE report last yesterday. So the WASDE is the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates. Uh, USDA updates that information once a month. Um, so on the very top, uh, highlighted in blue, is the average industry estimate for what they were expecting USDA to come out with. So that's that was the numbers that the, the average industry analyst was looking for um, to come out of the report yesterday. Now this is for ending stocks. So this would be, again, just a summary of both the supply and the demand areas. So how much grain are we gonna have in reserve just before harvest of, uh, or of 2022? Um, the bottom row highlighted in red is the numbers that actually were reported in the WASD. And then the highlighted black number just above that is the number that was reported last month. So just to remind everybody, the markets already have, had, have anticipated some changes. So the, the critical thing for when the report is released is not necessarily what was the number from last month, but more importantly, what is the number the trade is expecting to see? So what we really need to do is compare the blue row with the red, red row. So when you compare on wheat, um, the ending stocks in wheat was a little bit higher than what the trade was expecting. Actually, they were looking at very small changes. Um, USDA did uh, drop both domestic consumption and exports a slight amount. So there was kind of two small adjustments there on the corn side, basically left untouched from last year, last month's estimates. So corning and ending stocks did not change. Um, the trade was expecting a little bit of an increase or uptick in ethanol consumption. Uh, but that didn't appear in this, this month's report. On the soybean uh, column, they were expecting to have a slight cutback uh, in, in the ending stocks, basically an increase in demand. Um, USDA did increase the amount of soybeans going into the crushing sector, a small amount. That's where, that's where the change came in. Uh, I think most analysts were expecting a slight adjustment in the exports number, which did not come. So relatively small adjustments, small changes, no big shock value to it. The February report is typically not one of those big shock value kinds of reports that we get. On the next slide is a summary of USDA's forecast for South American production. We're going to look both at corn and soybeans in both Argentina and Brazil. And, and really, these were the numbers that I think everybody was anticipating to see what would happen from USDA's perspective on total production numbers. We know that there's been some drought in Argentina. That's been going on most of the season. We know that there has been some pretty severe drought conditions in southern Brazil. However, northern Brazil has had some very good weather and the yields coming off of the northern harvested soybeans um, have been very, very strong so far. But soybean harvest is now getting to the central and southern part of Brazil. And we're getting some better information um, from har harvest reports that, yeah, that crop isn't nearly as big as what we had expected. So once again, comparing the top row highlighted in blue with the bottom row highlighted in red, um, again, small adjustments and not major changes. We were not expecting big shifts, uh, but we got kind of what the trade was expecting. Now, on the next slide, I want to compare not only U.S. soybean production to Brazilian soybean production, 
but also talk a little bit about the differences between what the private forecasters are saying for yields coming out of Brazil versus how USDA makes those calculations. So the very top row, this last year in the US, we had a record soybean crop. Uh, this is reported in million metric ton, which is kind of what we use in the international trade sector. So just for reference point, our US record soybean production was about 121 million metric ton. If you look at the highlighted black line in Brazil, last year, Brazil produced 138 million metric ton. That was their total crop size. That was a new record. Now, when we were finishing up our harvest and, and they're planting soybeans down in Brazil, most of the private forecasters for, for production and yields were looking at an, at an increase in, in output between 140 to 145. So, you know, that was kind of the mentality as we were finishing our harvest here in the US and they were planting soybeans in Brazil. Now, the current USDA forecast, as you saw earlier, was 134 million metric ton. Most of the current private forecasters, when they look at what are their own estimates, are saying anywhere between 125 and 130, which is, again, a bit lower than what USDA is forecasting. And this morning, actually late yesterday, CONAB, which is kind of Brazil's version of USDA, came out with an updated forecast. So this is kind of the official government forecast of about 125.5 million metric ton. So why is the USDA forecast a little bit higher? It's when USDA does their forecasting, they're looking at current cropping conditions, they're getting as much harvest information as they can, but what they're assuming in their modeling and their forecasting for final numbers is that the weather is average from this time forward. So the assumption is that whatever their, their benchmark, the date that they do their forecasts on, the assumption is the weather will, con will be returned to normal or returned to average for the rest of the growing season. Well, obviously, if you're in the middle of a drought, a lot of the private forecasters are assuming that those drought conditions will continue and may even worsen. So that's one of the reasons we see this difference in the, in the two numbers. Um, and then also when Conab came out, the, the Brazilian version of USDA, they also dropped their forecast for total corn production. So these two reasons are, is part of the, the driving force, the kind of updraft we have now in both the corn and the soybean uh, markets over the last several weeks, actually. Um, the other thing that there has been it, over the last about a oh, week to 10 days, almost two weeks now, because of these lower forecasted numbers, we've seen some Chinese buying return into the U.S. market. So China is now returning to the U.S. market and buying some soybeans, not only from old crop for immediate delivery, but also for new crop. And so this is kind of an unusual time for the Chinese to come in and start buying um, U.S. soybeans. Normally, they're buying almost all of their product out of the Brazilian market. So this, too, is also giving psychologically, psychologically some boost to both corn and soybean prices. So on my next slide, I'd want to also talk a little bit about what's happening between Russia and Ukraine and the potential impact on wheat. Now, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but I do want to give you a quick geography lesson. So what I've tried to do here is zoom in on the kind of the, the key export facilities in both Russia and the Ukraine. So the, the blue stars are the major grain exporting terminals out of, out of Russia. Notice that there's the, Azov, the Sea of Azov, and then they have the Black Sea. So they've got a couple ports right along the back Black Sea, and then one up in the Sea of Azov. So the blue stars are Russian export facilities for grain. The red stars are Ukrainian export facilities. And then that black star down on the very bottom in that peninsula of Crimea is one of the large Russian naval bases. And so you can see that with the, the, the political tensions, as well as some of the military tensions growing between the Russian and Ukrainians, that this, is, this is, has a very high likelihood that we're going to spill over into potential grain movements as well. So on my next slide, this is actually a quote that came out this morning. Um, this is from Reuters News. It came out early this morning. And I'll just read it really quickly. Ukraine criticized Russian naval exercises near its southern coast on Thursday saying the presence of warships are part of the hybrid war that had been navig that made navigation in the Black Sea and Azov Sea virtually impossible. So because of these, these military drills, the military actions that are going on, again, Russia has announced they're gonna have these, 
these drills for for keeping their their um, soldiers, you know, at, at high levels. It's now spilling over or potentially spilling over into some of the grain shipments coming out of Ukraine in particular. So the second quote directly from the that report was that Moscow is staging these naval drills in the Black Sea um, this month and um, at the same time, it holds the ground drills. Again, we've been listening to that on the news between uh, uh, in Belarus, which is just north of the Ukraine. Uh, part of the show of force for the West says uh, could be a uh, precursor to an invasion, which Moscow den denies. So again, these political issues are starting to escalate. Um, it does have a significant possibility or potential to be able to uh, restrict the flow of not only wheat, because Russia is the largest wheat exporter and Ukraine is the third largest wheat exporter in the, in the, in the global markets right now, but also potentially restrict grain, uh, corn exports because Ukraine is the fourth largest corn exporter. So this is all now starting to be built into the marketplace. Some of these uncertainties are starting to also provide a bit of an updraft in particular in the corn market. My next slide um, is just, I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit to give you another perspective of what's going on on the right-hand side is, is Russia, on the left-hand side would be Ukraine. I put a little, if you notice, a little red bar on the very bottom. There's a canal that, that runs through the middle of Istanbul. It's a, a large city in Turkey. That canal is really the only way that vessels, ocean vessels, can get between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. So again, another potential choke point from a military standpoint is to try and just block off that canal, which then would restrict not only grain shipments, but also potentially crude oil shipments and, and LNG or liquefied natural gas shipments. So again, these, these tensions growing can have spillover effects in a lot of other industries and a lot of other markets. So my last slide, um, kind of a question I've been getting more recently is, so will this impact US winter wheat? So the classes of wheat, the, the type of wheat that Ukraine and Russia export it would be classified as a hard red winter wheat in our system. So will this have an impact on US hard red winter wheat prices? Will that cause an updraft in the wheat market, thus allowing spring wheat to go higher as well? And, and the question is really unclear. I, I think it's gonna take a pretty large disruption for US hard red winter wheat prices to really be impacted in a dramatic way. And this is a, a, um, a price chart. This is a price forward chart. So this would be like your local elevator putting bids for delivery in the future. So if they're gonna buy grain from you several months into the future, what are their current bids and prices? So what I did was I gathered the information for the, the uh, prices loaded on, for wheat loaded onto an ocean vessel, and then the freight rates, the ocean freight from that particular port to North Asia. So think about like Japan or South Korea, potentially China. So just to give you an idea of what the different bids are and the different prices. So if you're in North Asia, like a Japanese buyer, and you're saying, well, if I wanna buy hard red winter wheat off the global market, what kind of prices might I be looking at at different period delivery periods? So this is from March of, of 2022, all the way through November of 2022. The brown line on the very bottom is Ukrainian 11 and half protein wheat. The red line is Russia 11 and half protein wheat. Of course, their ports are very close to each other. So the prices are gonna be very similar. Now the US Gulf about about 11% protein wheat is the green line on top. So right now, one of the challenges we're having in the wheat market is because corn prices are so high, US wheat prices have to be even higher to be able to prevent the, the wheat from going into the feed supplies. So right now today in the global market, our hard red winter wheat is priced kind of at a high level relative to some other major suppliers like Argentina and Australia and of course the Black Sea. So if the exports get cut off from the Black Sea region, Ukraine and Russia, if they, if they kind of have to back away from the marketplace for a while, Global wheat prices will increase. The question is, will they increase enough to make US hard red winter wheat competitive in the global markets? I, I do think we'll see a pretty substantial increase, but it may not directly translate into a lot of additional US hard red winter wheat exports. So I just want everybody to be cautious. I do think we'll pick up some additional sales, but, but it may not be the larger volumes that I think some people are hoping for or counting on. 
So with that, I'll, I'll take a short pause. If there's any questions, I'll try and answer them now. Um, and then I'll let Tim get set up for uh, his portion of the discussion. Brian, I'll ask a, a quick question, uh, maybe Certainly. a little bit early, but uh, your thoughts about plantings. I'm, I'm wondering about how many soybean acres are going to get planted this year relative to corn. Yeah, and, and again, when you look at, and we got to separate kind of old crop pricing from new crop pricing. When you look at what's happening in the new crop markets right now, again, the, a very nice heavy lift, a, a, an updraft is what I call it, an increase in, in November soybean futures which then is also causing some increase in the December corn futures. So I do think it nationally, we need to have about the same kind of balance between corn and soybean acres as we did last year. We, we can see a little bit of a shifting, a little, slight reduction in corn, a slight increase in soybeans, but we can't get, let soybeans get too out of balance relative to corn because we still have some very strong demand base for corn. Now, so far, wheat has been kind of lagging behind. It hasn't been caught up in this, this competition or bidding for acres quite yet. But I do think in particular for hard red spring wheat, because it's spring planted, that will join the mix here pretty shortly. So if you're looking at spring wheat pricing, I do think we'll see some lifting, some improvement in spring wheat futures markets as, as we get closer to spring planting to be a bit more competitive with some of the other crops. So at a, at, in, in the corn belt, I don't expect to see big shifts between corn and soybeans, but the shifting for acres or the bidding for acres, kind of this, this acreage battle is really up here in the Northern Plains in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, because we grow all of these other smaller market crops that can suddenly make the acreage shift more important. So a long-winded answer to a relatively short question. Good afternoon, Tim Petra here, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, uh, USDA NAS in the last month has issued the three annual inventory reports for cattle, sheep, and hogs. So I'm just going to summarize those in a quick review. They all showed lower numbers, which obviously is supportive to prices. So first of all, let's go to the uh, beef cow side of it and the cattle. And I don't have time, uh, you know, I could spend uh, an hour just on the entire cattle report. We're just going to do beef cows because that's what gives us uh, beef production. And on the top is January 1st beef cows and then for the commodities I'm going to say how North Dakota might compare because uh, we differed in many respects in, in the commodity so on the cattle beef cattle side up there you see in the uh, upper chart to the right hand side uh, we beef cow numbers as expected declined again about 2.3 percent and again, right now, a drought monitor came out this morning, but half the beef cow herd is in area drought. And so that's why we uh, thought numbers would go down. It's the third straight year of declining beef cow numbers cyclically. And usually we do decline in a, when we, in, in a cycle, a uh, liquidation phase is usually four years. So our expectation probably, and some others on that too, but as dry as it is, and, we, and we'll see in a little while some other things that we, we may, uh, uh, you know, prices are high enough now that would probably stimulate some increase in numbers, but it looks like uh, there is a good chance that they will go down again. But anyway, that's positive for uh, prices. Our calf crop is going to be lower this year. And, uh, and uh, so uh, again, supportive to prices. North Dakota then, uh, similar in the last couple of years, we did buck the trend. Uh, numbers actually declined there in, in, in uh, 2019 and 20 and then 21 and it's up in the US, but only the last two years in North Dakota, uh, we uh, did fall off 2% again this year. And that was expected with the uh, uh, drought that we're experiencing and uh, not quite as much as, as the US, but, but similar. So a decline there as well. So we'll have fewer calves in North Dakota. So if we go to the next slide, uh, just uh, on the top then is the January 1st beef cow replacement heifers saved and so you see we're down there again uh, about uh, a little over three percent three point three percent 
to start January. So that maybe funnels into again that we'll take the beef cow herd down a little bit for the, the fourth straight years. And again, weather is going to be the big factor there. Uh, again, half the beef cow herd in a drought. We kind of bucked the trend some here in uh, North Dakota on replacement heifers. We've been keeping a lot of replacement heifers in North Dakota. You see those, uh, uh, we did go down uh, about 4% on replacement heifers here in, in uh, North Dakota over last year, but still on a historic basis, we have a lot, we've been saving a lot of replacement heifers in North Dakota. It's been a good enterprise for people. And, and, uh, and uh, we have the highest quality heifers in the US and they're in high demand and heifers are extremely discounted in the fall. And even now the lighter weight heifers, $30 a hundred weight and so on. So we background them, keep them in the spring, then they can go to a feedlot. And actually you see, uh, we started off this year now the eighth all time all time high number eighth place in replacement heifers and last year we were in sixth place all the way back to 1920 in fact five out of the last six years have been in the top 10 uh, for number of replacement heifers held and so uh but those six that that number six place that we had at the beginning last year again uh, a lot of those that weren't that hadn't been bred these are replacement heifers that are really two crops it's the replacement heifers that haven't calved that are going to start calving here soon or calve after january 1st anyway and it's also the heifer calves save back that were designated as replacement heifers but again last year uh, some of those went to went to feedlots and so when we go to the next slide i'm just going to i'm sure i've been having meetings all over the state here since uh, the report came out on january 31st and the question that i always get is is uh didn't why didn't beef cows go down more than that and if you've been listening to my webinars all last summer i said yeah we're going to have a lower numbers in north dakota but you know people were saying there's going to be 30 percent down 40 percent down or whatever and i disagreed with that i said we might be down from two to four percent would be my uh guess Yes, and, uh, and I'm going to show you why that I use that estimate and why beef cow numbers were just down 2%. Uh, cattle producers, beef cow producers in the Northern Plains in particular, but probably all over the US are very resilient and do whatever is necessary to maintain herds and, and, um, and, and fine feed and, and do all sorts of things. And so I, the top chart there, that purple line, uh, Adnan Akiz is our state climatologist and the drought monitor first came out in 2000. So he's, kept, he, he's got a formula for the intensity of drought Drought, and you know, since the drought monitor started in 2000, and uh, so those numbers way on the top then show the drought intensity and how uh, bad the drought was. And of course, our drought this past year in 2021 was the worst drought since 2000. But if we, but then right in the middle, you see those numbers there, and you see some purple circles there. That is the percentage change in the beef cow herd the January first after the drought occurred. And those numbers then, uh, the, the 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 absolute numbers are on the chart below that you've seen before of the change in numbers. But I'm looking at percent. So if we go back and look at the second worst drought, which was back in 2006, but in January. 1st of 2007, we had the same amount of, 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 of uh, cows. Go back to towards the right hand side, you see the third worst drought uh, back in 2017. We actually had 1% more beef cows than we had, even though it was a drought. Then go back to the left hand side, yeah, the fourth drought there. Uh, uh, in 2008, we did go down a 3.2%. Probably the changes in beef cow numbers are more because of prices relative, rather than drought is, is what this bears out. But anyway, we had more there. It also might be a result that we had uh, very dry in 2006, right in the middle of 2007. It did get better, but then got worse right away and then dry in 2008. So, you know, we had almost 
uh, two and a half years there, and that funneled into it. And then we go to the fifth worst droughts there in 2012. We actually had 7% more beef cows. So that's, you know, where I was getting my prediction that, that uh, we were not going to be down major double ditch categories like people expected. Now, on the other hand, let's go to the right hand side of the chart. And, you know, drought conditions persist. There's no snow in uh, West River. It's dry. Our pastures are a beat down and we're going to need a lot of rain so certainly we hope it rains and in, in the southeastern south central part of north dakota it, it did get some refreshing last fall but we're going to need rain and if that doesn't happen we are going to have more the, uh, a liquidation than we had this year but we certainly hope it rains so move along uh, uh, then to the next slide and uh, just uh, show you how lower numbers then are impacting prices. On the top then there's our 800 pound yearlings. I usually do show you this and you see uh, that red line there starting at the, at the left hand side of the chart is higher than the last uh, three years uh, by quite a bit. And then those red squares are the futures market closes today and you see the futures market is expecting a continual increase from the 165 five average last week, you know, up to near 180 by May, and then in the fall, up there close just under 190, 188 or so. And then that to gold square then is the January 2023 futures are showing even uh, higher prices because of those lower calf crops we expect. And then on the bottom are the lighter weight 550 to six weight calves and the same thing there, you know, last uh, a couple of several years, last three years, we averaged about 170 at this time. And last week we averaged 195 and expectations like those feeder cattle futures show that we're up there 190 to 200 by this fall quite a bit better. So those are, you know, we've got a good demand for beef on the fed cattle side. So fed cattle prices are higher in futures and, and then our lower supply. So moving to the next slide, then uh, we'll just uh, talk a little bit about sheep. The, the uh, U.S. Uh, number of breeding ewes has been pretty constant at about 3 million head for a number of years, but uh, did fall off 1.7 this year. Uh, two thirds of our, since most of our sheep are in Western U.S. and the entire Western U.S. now is dry. Uh, uh, U numbers did go down 1.7%, all due to drought with the prices that sheep or that lambs are now, we would have expected them to, maybe the numbers to go up a little bit, but the drought uh, limited that. Then North Dakota on the bottom, again, we kind of bucked the trend there. We had no, even in spite of our drought, we had no change in breeding U numbers. Uh, th this year over last year. And then, you know, we've seen a resurgence in, in uh, increasing U numbers the previous two years and that we were up uh, uh, pretty strong there in, uh, in 2019 to 20. Uh, and uh, then 14% uh, then, uh, and then another 5% a, a year ago and then leveled off. So, uh, so anyway, the U.S., of uh, lamb crop is going to be down a little and so go to the next slide is uh, supporting prices and we have you know a very good demand for lamb and and uh, lower numbers so uh there's the uh the purple line then is is the average of 2016 to 20 but again uh, last year uh, after we got the pandemic some of it behind us and restaurants started open up again and so on we brought lamb prices up and they're already you know uh, they're 235 on fed lambs uh, versus about 175 a year ago so uh, a lot better lamb prices there and our expectation to continue and then the same on the feeder lambs below so let's go on to the next and talk a little bit about hogs uh, the uh, this the inventory on the cattle and sheep was as of January first, but the USDA does it a month earlier on hogs. So this is of December first, uh, so the year is twenty 
21, but it actually it'd be the start of 2022 numbers. So you see there our breeding uh, herd did fall off in 2020. You'll see in a minute with prices, 2020 was just a terrible year for hog prices because of the pandemic and we drew, reduced our herd down. And it's the, it's, the breeding herd is still uh, kind of historically low now on, on December 1st. So down in the bottom chart, you see this on December 1st, we had uh, fewer market hogs than the year before. That's going back to those 20, December 2020 hog uh, sows that we had the year before up in the top chart, and we've got the same number. So we'll be down there on uh, market hogs again. So uh, go to while you're going to the next chart, I will mention again that uh, North Dakota did buck the trend, and actually we have six percent more market hogs on on December first in North Dakota when uh, the U.S. was down about four percent. So we're going to have more hogs to sell at higher prices, which is good news for North Dakota. So the top chart is uh, base slaughter hog. Uh, prices at the packing plants. You see the purple line there in the bottom. Again, $50 carcass weight hogs in 2020 is what caused us to cut back on sows. And then last year, the blue line, we saw a significant impact increase in prices up to mid-year, up to $112. And then the seasonal pattern for hogs is for them to go up into July and then down into the fall. And so uh, now we're starting off above uh, last year, up there about uh, $83 now compared to 70 last year. And the red uh, diamonds there are the what the futures market today is saying, back up by July up to $114. Uh, uh, there in July, 110 and so on in uh, in uh, in August and in there in July and so pretty much following last year except a little bit higher and of course then on the bottom that that causes feeder pig prices to be in demand too. We've got fewer of them and they're looking at those $114 uh, uh, slaughter hog prices in July that these feeder pigs finish out on. So uh, all, like I said, all the sectors look very positive in prices with the lower numbers and also the, the uh, strong demand. So uh, with that, this wrap up and say, you know, a reminder that uh, that Valentine's Day is coming up here in case you forgot on Monday. So keep that on your calendar and, you know, a good my, uh, present might be uh, 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 steak or pork chops or lamb chops. And with that, then let's go to, uh, uh, is it Ron or Dave next? Ron. It's me, it's me Tim. It's, okay, uh, go. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, Ron, Ron Hogan uh, with Farm Management. There's my contact information. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about the NDSU crop budgets that we just released. So the first slide basically just says, I wrote a news article the other day, and uh, that's the headline, N NDSU projects crop profits. <laughs> and uh, so these were very frustrating this year with a big run up in the input costs and the, and the volatility and the commodity prices. And we try to make these budgets for, uh, for the, what we think it's gonna be the average for the year. It's not necessarily what things are right today. It's, the, it's our best guess. And, and there's a lot, it got to be a lot of guessing. Uh, these budgets do vary quite a bit by crop and by region. And always remember, these are a guide. Uh, it's, just, it's just something that uh, a farmer can fill in his, whole num his, his own numbers because he, the, every situation is different. And one thing to remember too, that these are estimates of return to labor and management with no consideration to the, to the risk. So next, I wanna show you the budget map. We, we break the state down into four or nine regions. And, um, and basically there's, there's cropping systems that are unique for those various regions. They do things certain ways. Um, as I've done these crop budgets over the years, things are getting a little more homogeneous and, and things, and may, maybe at some point we could maybe just have five regions instead of nine. But at this point, this is what we're doing. So the next side, I wanna talk about some generalizations. I won't show you any numbers. Uh, the budgets are, 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 are on the web now. Um, generally, for most all regions, there's been an improved profit from the previous year. When I first started these 
working on these, I thought, man, everything's going to be negative with the high fertilizer prices and the high chemical prices. But um, it actually didn't turn out too bad. Um, on a negative note, of course, we know all about the, the increases in fertilizer prices and then certain chemicals. All chemicals are up, but especially some like Roundup and Liberty. But this is what was a surprise to me. Well, not a surprise, I should have known. But, uh, I checked with Eggweiss and Northwood and they do all the, they do a very good job of, of, the, of, of keeping track of the soil nu nutrient levels throughout the state. And they're basically double from last year because of the drought. The, the crop didn't take the nutrients out like a normal year. Now you may have, your farm may have a, may, 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 be, may have had some rain showers and you may have had a good crop during the drought. So as Brian mentioned earlier, uh, uh, soil tests are just a must this year, uh, you, uh, but you could actually save quite a bit on the, on the fertilizer bill. Um, and, and I put the regional tests, uh, regional uh, nutrient test is, is a, for each region. So, so that helped a lot on the fertilizer cost per acre. Uh, the, next, uh, the next slide, I'm gonna talk about the costs. Uh, as I mentioned, fertilizer costs have had the most increase of all the costs. Um, and, and even with, if even when you factor in uh, applying a, a, a less rate um, because of the higher nutrients, it's still the highest cost. Crops like corn and wheat too, uh, uh, big fertilizer users, they were the hardest hit as far as the cost. And also crops that, re uh, also, you know, uh, pesticide costs have increased and uh, also uh, crops that, ha that have a lot of pesticide usage, they really showed a significant increase in costs. Everything seemed to be up. Seed was up for, for most, cr most crops. Fuel, of course, we know, know that's up. We see that at the pump repairs and ownerships, they, that always seems to go up every year. Um, uh, land rents, you know, we don't have much hard data on that. Um, and uh, so the data we have shows things fairly flat. Uh, we don't get our next uh, land rent survey till April. So, so at this point, uh, we kind of kept them flat. Uh, the yields then, um, the, the next slide, the, the yields then that we that we used are based on an, on an average of seven year moving average. And then of course we got our commodity prices from from Frain and he has, he's done his best to, to try figure out an, uh, 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 a price for the for the year. And with all that, everything seemed to be very positive. I wanted to note that we do a lot of different crops in these budgets, a lot of specialty crops, and some of them look like they have a very good return and you really don't want to plant the whole crop to a whole uh, the whole uh, farm to a, to a specialty crop. You're taking a very high risk. A lot of them have contracts and and uh, and and, and, re and reduction in, and uh, and uh, 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 limitations on on what they'll pay is uh, it, with the yield. So make sure and use these as a guide. Uh, here is the the next slide shows the link to get to the crop budgets. And the next slide, I'm going to talk about crop compare. That is another tool that kind of goes along with these budgets. We use our budget numbers, and this is available online too. We only use the direct costs, and it's kind of a way of, of changing prices and, and comparing, comparing costs among, among the crops. If you're, we, we, we can grow a, a myriad of different crops in North Dakota. So if you want to try different crops, you can, you can pick a reference crop. And, and then it, it will actually uh, kind of show you the differences. Uh, the next slide, I wanna make sure that, that you understand that this is for checking uh, scenarios until you actually make your final planting de decision. Um, you, you look at break-even prices. Um, we're assuming that, that, that kind of a assumption that the fixed costs are, are static. For example, you could probably grow wheat and barley with the same equipment. But if you had some crop that you don't have the proper equipment, you need to adjust your costs for that. Uh, so it doesn't account for that. Uh, the last slide then uh, shows you the, um, the, the link to get to the crop compare program on our, on our website. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks Ron. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share those uh, links uh, in an email following today's webinar. I, I just have some really quick comments about uh, recently announced funding from USDA. Uh, and the, the reason I want to talk about it is not so much that uh, the funding is there, but rather taking it as a signal of what might be coming uh, from USDA and federal farm policy uh, in the next farm bill in upcoming years. And so anyways, on Monday, there was a, an announcement that was somewhat expected 
uh, regarding uh, uh, monies available for what they're calling climate smart commodities. And this is really part of the, a push that's been around for you know over a year with a new administration for climate smart agriculture. And again, this is really just broadly speaking about ways that we can uh, manage greenhouse gas emissions uh, in agriculture and forestry. Uh, what, what they decided to do at USDA is, is take a, a billion dollars uh, with monies from the CCC. Uh, I remember when a billion dollars was a lot of money. Uh, I think it maybe still is to some extent, but that's what they, they've set aside with this. And again, uh, these are things that you know the administration can, can do without acts of Congress, uh, similar to what the last administration did to help offset losses from the trade war. Uh, but anyways, there's two pools of money available. Uh, and there's actually a really quick turnaround for both of these. So with the first pool, they're looking for large scale projects from five to $100 million. Those proposals are due in less than two months. Uh, and then there's a sm uh, the second pool, which is due later uh, at the end of May is for smaller projects from 250,000 to just under $5 million. So these are obviously uh, quite large projects or could be uh, quite large projects uh, going forward. Anyways, you know, they're looking for a couple of things. This is where I think it's kind of important. You know, they're looking for uh, pilot projects uh, that help us identify how we can best manage greenhouse gas flows, looking at the, the costs and the benefits, you know, how, how to best conduct these practices. Uh, and again, to me, I think this might be a signal of the practices that would be approved, uh, likely by the federal government for funding. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of laying that foundation. First, there's this signal that, hey, we can use CCC to, 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 to find funding. And second, we're looking specifically at practices that might be uh, good for the environment or good for climate uh, with the actual activities that would be funded. Uh, here's a laundry list of some of the projects they're looking at. I removed the most of those which were focusing primarily on forestry. Uh, most of these aren't surprising if you're, if you're familiar uh, with uh, what's been done recently in this space. But it might, again, be kind of a signal of where future farm programs might be providing uh, monies to farmers, to producers for, for new practices. So cover crops, uh, strip till, no till, uh, nutrient management and the like. And you can just see that, that full battery of lists. These, these aren't anything new. But again, it could be you know, that, that some of these, all of these would end up being uh, different options for farmers to practice you know, beginning in... 2024 and, and, and forward uh, with some sort of financial assistance uh, from the federal government. Uh, again, they're really kind of looking at a couple of things. One is the practice themselves. Then also, how do you monitor and verify these things? And finally, how do you build a market? And, and each one of these legs are really important to kind of what's going on with these emerging carbon markets. Uh, and, and so you can see that this is supportive of things that have been happening in, in many respects, largely in, in the voluntary markets, uh, the carbon offset markets, and not federal programs to date, but they really align closely with what is a, a, evolving or kind of coming together uh, on that private side. And so this is to support those private activities to some extent, but then also possibly uh, to provide that foundation for future activity that the federal government might be supporting. So I, I do think it's important for everybody in agriculture to, to, to take note of this. Again, the, the administration found uh, you know, a, a billion dollars out of CCC, uh, even though it's, you know, it's, a, it's a driven by the administration itself. Most of these aims are, are, are broadly supported uh, in agriculture across both parties uh, and, and geographically to, to in, in general. Uh, so I think it is important for us to, to, to keep wind of this, uh, to see how this goes also in a, in a few months to see which types of projects are selected, to see what folks are thinking about uh, how climate smart commodities, climate smart agriculture might look, both in terms of federal programs and then in terms of what we end up doing uh, in the country uh, to, to take advantage or to uh, help support uh, these climate issues that we're facing. So that was the official end of the, the, the remarks that we had prepared. Uh, we do have some time for questions. I believe we might have some already. Uh, we'd ask you to use the Q&A tool, but the chat tool works as well. Uh, we'll go through those questions as, as we have time. As, as long as they keep coming, uh, we'll, be, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, as I mentioned, I will send a 
a URL uh, for, for uh, Professor Wackenheim's survey, as well as the URLs for the crop budget and, and crop compare that, that, that Ron just talked about. Uh, so with that, I think we can open it up to questions if anybody wants to grab some that are up there. Uh, I see one for I, I you, see Ron. there's a question about the sugar beet, do we do a sugar beet budget? No, we do not. We have not done that for many, many years. It was kind of hard to, for us to get the information that we wanted and it, it's kind of, and we just decided we're not gonna do it. Uh, we don't do potatoes either, I guess. Um, and uh, it was just, we got enough to do and and uh, it was just tougher to get the data. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the potato, especially potatoes, uh, potatoes they got, they're contracted and it's kind of like private information sometimes, so. <clears throat> And I, and I think it was the same question on both. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, did anybody else have any other questions or comments or thoughts that came up when others were speaking? It, well, you know, one question I have is, you know, with, the, with this these changes in fertilizer prices, what might, you know, the implications be? How, you know, how long lived is, are these high prices going to be? Is it, you know, just for this this crop year, this marketing year? And then also too, you know, are we going to see shifts in practices, you know, and, and, and Brian already spoke about, you know, testing being really important, you know, more testing, but then also even shifts of different uh, fertilizers and shifts of crops, you know, depending on profitability. Although Ron, like you said, you know, even though a lot of these input prices are high, there's, there's, these are still profitable. Most of them are still, still expected to be profitable. But as I don't see any other questions uh, to make best use of everybody's time, I want to thank everybody for joining us and the panelists for, for presenting today. Uh, our next webinar will be uh, in four weeks uh, on March 10th uh, at the same URL. If you've been registered, you're, you're, you're registered for the rest of the year. I will try and send a reminder out beforehand to, to get, it, uh, get that reminder out to you. And of course, you can see uh, this uh, recording of this webinar as well as past webinars the slide deck and past slide decks on the URL on the screen. Usually that takes a couple of days just to get everything edited and, and, and up, uh, but it will be there shortly. And as I mentioned, I'll send out the, the links for the other resources we talked about today. Um, and with that, I hope you guys all have a, a great weekend. And as, as Tim mentioned, uh, a happy, enjoyable Valentine's Day. Thanks. Mm -hmm.